this is our fourth class, which originally we were only supposed to have four classes, but it turns out that the holidays are taking so much time that I've extended it by two classes. So this is still part of class number two. This is the last uh, installment of class number two, please God. We're on the third part of the holidays. And um, just as a quick review, in the first part of this class on the Jewish holidays, right, we covered Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh being the new month. And then in part two, we talked about the fact that there are six biblically mandated holidays, right? Four occur in the fall and are called the high holidays, and two occur in the spring. So the six holidays are Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shmini Atzeret, Simchat Torah, or Simchat Torah, if you're pronouncing it correctly, Passover, and Shavuot. Okay, so those are the six biblically mandated holidays. And we also talked about the fact that three of these, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, are what are called the pilgrimage festivals. And that means that when the temple was standing, and when it is standing again, when we have another temple, that it is required for every Jew in the world to come to Israel during those three holidays to bring a sacrifice. Now, I'm not 100% sure what would be done if the temple is standing and it's impossible to come. Uh, I guess the assumption was that back in biblical times, everybody was able to make the journey as long as they planned, you know, enough in advance to be able to make the journey. Um, you know, if they were coming from somewhere in Europe or even like Iran and Iraq, um, you know, that would take a few weeks uh, by foot or by donkey or camel, but they had to come to make a sacrifice. Now, one of those holidays, we also talked about this last week, Sukkot will be observed to some degree by the whole world once the Messiah comes, all right, and the temple is rebuilt. And we went into detail to talk about also um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur being the only biblical man, biblically mandated fast day, okay? So what the fall holidays, because they, it is the anniversary of the creation of the world, um, Rosh Hashanah, we explained, first of all, I explained that there were four actual New Year's, right? And Rosh Hashanah and pa Passover, Pesach, are two of the four. Um, the beginning of the month prior to Rosh Hashanah, Elul, is one of the um, New Year's. It's the New Year for the counting of the animals and the tithing of the animals. And we explained that uh, from that day until the end of Yom Kippur is 40 days, and that's a very significant count. And it's an opportunity for us to rive, rise above our animal nature. So the animals are judged on that day, but we, being made in the image of God, need to rise above that. And that's why we take those 40 days, which is what is required in order to make a shift in really, I mean, even if you look at uh, a lot of the neurological studies in the modern, in our modern era, they talk about how it takes 40 days to uh, make a new habit, to change the way you, you think about things. And so 40 is very significant in Judaism. And it's 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul, which is the uh, New Year's for the animals, until Yom Kippur, which is when everything is written in the books. So Rosh Hashanah, which is 30 days after Rosh Chodesh Elul, is the new year for the world, for mankind, all of mankind. Yom Kippur being the Day of Atonement for the Jewish people. And on Rosh Hashanah, it said that the books are open. And Yom Kippur, it's been sealed. But that we have until Sukkot, which is five days after Yom Kippur, uh, and then to the end of Sukkot, Shemini Atzeret, before the books are actually closed, Sukkot being uh, the uh, judgment day for the rest of the world, uh, the day of atonement or week of atonement, if you will, for the rest of the world. Okay, so there's a lot of symbolism in there, but um, 
So the um, on Yom Kippur, right? When we go now, we're going to come into the holiday of Sukkot. Yom Kippur is over. We have five days until the first day of Sukkot. Okay. On Yom Kippur, what did we do? We fasted. We abandoned the physical world and we ignored our physical needs for a day. And on Sukkot, we go one step beyond the physical. Now we can feed the physical. In fact, we're told to rejoice in eating and eating and all of those things are part of that holiday. Um, but what we're doing is we're going beyond the physical as we celebrate the purely spiritual joy that comes from being enveloped in God's presence. And that's really what the sukkah represents. It represents full reliance on God and being completely and fully enveloped in God's presence. And that is why I believe that, um, that this is the holiday that is going to be celebrated to some degree by the entire world. Okay. So it, you might, be interested to know that there are only three mitzvot, there are only three commandments that one can actually be inside of, okay? The one is a mikvah, right? That's the immersion pool. We'll talk about that in two weeks. Living in Israel and the sukkah. So if you're in a sukkah in Israel, you're actually fulfilling two of the three commandments that can be fulfilled by being inside of them. And there's something very special about that, this idea of being enveloped in God's presence. All right, so the Torah tells us in uh, Vayikra 23, verses 39 through 43, on exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. I'll come back to that in a second, but you might want to note, it says you're supposed to celebrate for seven days. What's this eighth day thing going on? It continues. Now, on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of the leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them not booze, but booths, <laughs> when I brought them from the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So we're commanded to live in this booth, and we'll talk a minute in a minute about what that looks like, or hut, for seven days. And on the eighth day, which is, by the way, a completely separate holiday, because it says we're only supposed to celebrate Sukkot for seven days. On the eighth day, we have this other holiday that we do not go into the sukkah for. We only live in it for seven days. Although outside of Israel, they add an extra day, which I explained, uh, I think, on the class on Rosh Chodesh. Uh, but for right now, we're not going to talk about the extra day that's added. We're just going to talk about the way it's celebrated in uh, Israel, which is more like the way it's described in the Torah. Okay? So um, we celebrate for seven days the Feast of Sukkot, we, are, we live in this booth for seven days. We take these four species, an etrog, which is the citron, the willow, the palm, and the um, myrtle. We put them together. We wave them each day, and we feast, and we spend time with friends and family, and that's how we observe this seven-day holiday. Now, um, just a few things about it. Uh, first of all, the seven intermediary or six intermediary days, all right? Not the first day, which is a yum tov. It's like Shabbat, except that we can cook. But the rest of the days are a semi-holiday, very similar to Rosh Chodesh. The term is called Chol Hamoed. And Chol Hamoed means, um, actually, I wrote it down somewhere. It means the weekday of the holiday, okay? Um, basically, they are half holidays. If you can take off from work, you're supposed to 
although it's not forbidden. Um, basically, you're only supposed to work if you just, there's no way that you can make, take the time off or you would lose too much money or whatever. But, but um, and many Jewish people during Cholomoed will not enter into any contracts. They won't sign anything. They won't buy anything except for like what they need for the holiday. They basically try to observe it as a semi-holiday. All right. And during that time, they live in this sukkah. Now, everybody's definition of live in is different. In Israel, a lot, there are people who bring out like all their furniture practically and they actually live in the sukkah. Like they, they only leave the sukkah to go to the bathroom. Um, and then you have everything from that to people, especially in North America, where it's cold sometimes on Sukkot, um, they'll, take a, they'll take their meals in the sukkah but otherwise they don't go out into the sukkah. Now there was a question that was asked on the Facebook group, uh, what do people do who live in apartments and can't build a sukkah? Well, it depends. If you live in a really Jewish neighborhood or if you live in Israel, a lot of the apartments allow you to put up a sukkah on the green area outside the apartment. Yes, it means that you have to bring everything out to the sukkah you know, if you live on the third floor, it means all the food, you have to bring it down the three flights of stairs and back up the three flights of stairs, but people do it. Also in Israel, they build, many of the apartments have porches and they stagger the porches so that there's nothing above the porch so that it's open to the sky so that they can build their sukkah on the porch. So in Israel, a lot of the apartments have sukkah porches. And on top of the idea that a lot of people are allowed to build their sukkahs outside the apartment complex, some apartment complexes actually allow uh, people to build the sukkah on top of the roof, depending on the apartment, how it's constructed, how hard or easy it is to get up to the roof. There are many apartments in um, Israel where people put their sukkah up on the roof of the apartment building. It's similar to putting it outside in that you still have to walk up or down, you know, several flights of stairs to bring all your stuff up to the sukkah. Although I would feel less exposed, I think, having my sukkah on the porch than having it out in the front yard uh, where anybody could walk in. Uh, although Generally speaking, that doesn't happen in Israel, that people respect that this is not my sukkah and so I'm not going to go into it. Now, the, the laws or the definition of what the sukkah is, is it has to be at least two and a half complete walls, okay? Now, four is preferred, but it only has to be two and a half, okay? And um, so it can actually be U-shaped. It can be open on one end, uh, although most people will at least put a curtain or something across there just for privacy's sake. Also, uh, the walls can actually be permanent. You wouldn't think so since the hut itself is by definition not permanent, but what makes it not permanent is the roof, all right? So there are some people in Israel that will build um, a four or three walled structure like attached to their house and it's just open on top and like during the summer maybe they'll they'll throw some stuff on top of it and they'll, they'll use it as outdoor living space what makes it a, okay for a sukkah is then you remove whatever is on top and you put down the material that is required for a sukkah and it's supposed to be natural uh but cut off from its roots so you can use like um a lot of people use uh, palm fronds in Israel. In America, we used to use like Christmas tree branches <laughs> um, because they're evergreen and, and it's just really pretty as the rooftop. Uh, you can also use bamboo sticks. You can even use regular wood poles, but they're not supposed to be wider than a certain distance because then otherwise it'll look like it's a permanent roof. And you're supposed to be able to see at least a little bit through the through the roof, although a lot of times with these bamboo mats that people use, you can't really see the sky. Um, but, and there are some who actually have a custom that they don't make it so that you can see through it. Uh, but there is a halacha, a law, 
that says that the rain has to be, if it starts raining, the rain has to be able to get through within, I think, three minutes or something like that. So it has to be temporary. The rain has to be able to come in through it. You can't use a plastic sheet on top of it. It has to be, you have to be exposed to the elements in essence, because that is what signifies your total and complete reliance on God. Now, in the modern age that we live, the rabbis have said that if it's too cold or way too hot or dangerous for some reason, you don't actually have to sleep in it and you can just go out and have your meal and then come back into the house. So um, also you should know that the walls cannot be completely see-through because then it doesn't represent the idea of a home, right? Our homes, we have walls because there's a certain sense of privacy. So you could have, for example, the walls of a sukkah could be half solid and half lattice or plastic that you can see through or whatever, but not the entire wall. The entire wall is not supposed to be completely see-through because then there's no privacy. All right. So anytime I explain something to you um, and I say, you know, well, according to some it's this and according to others, it's that keep in mind that, you know, there are different ways of interpreting things and uh, understanding what's acceptable and what's not. So for example, according to most authorities, a sukkah whose walls are made completely of lattice is not kosher. But I've seen sukkahs made completely of lattice. So somebody somewhere thinks that it's okay. Um, this is why in Judaism, it's very, very important to find a rabbi you trust you know, not just any rabbi, but one that you've built a relationship with and that you trust and then follow his guidance, okay? Even, I think, as a non-Jew, as a Noahide, you can find a rabbi in your community and say, I'm a Noahide, I don't believe that I'm supposed to convert to Judaism, but I still want a rabbi for guidance. Can you be my rabbi? And some will say no. I don't know enough about being a Noahide to be able to guide you properly. And others will say, sure, absolutely. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, I already mentioned that the roof cannot be permanent. It must be made of natural materials such as bamboo, wood, or tree branches, but they have to be cut off the tree. And you can't have a live attached tree branch hanging over the roof either. So when we place our sukkah, we have to make sure that there's no tree branches hanging over where we're going to put the sukkah, or we have to trim those tree branches or find another place, all right? And uh, we eat and we sleep in it and preferably do all activities except for unclean ones, like going to the bathroom and some other things I won't mention here. Um, we're supposed to live in it, all right? So... And in addition, it says that we're supposed to take these four species I mentioned before, the citron, what we call in Hebrew the etrog, which is a, it looks like a giant lemon, and uh, palm frond and myrtle branch and willow branch. And we take them together and we wave them. And there's some blessings that we say. Now, the four uh, species are said to represent four types of Jews. Okay, there are other, there's actually like four or five different explanations for what these different species could represent, but generally speaking, it's, it's a representation of the idea of unity, all right? We take them together each morning in the sukkah, and we write, recite a blessing, and we wave them. Now, just a note about celebrating Sukkot as a non-Jew. I recently read an opinion, because this has come up several times, that there's an opinion that Noahides, B'nai Noach, are not permitted to create a new religion. Now, like I said, it's one, one opinion, but that's why there are some rabbis who rule that Noahides can't do certain mitzvot because since they're not commanded to, taking these on as obligations amounts to creating a new religion. So the guideline thus given is that if you want to celebrate a holiday, and again, this is the guideline according to those who say 
that you're not allowed to take on an obligation that a Jewish person takes on because you're creating a new religion. That guideline says that if you want to celebrate a holiday, um, only do those aspects which make sense for a non-Jew. What does that mean? All right, let's take the sukkah. It makes sense that a person might enjoy uh, sitting in a hut, right? Because it provides shade, it's pretty, uh, you know, these things, right? But it doesn't make sense that a person would um, think of picking up a palm frond, a myrtle, a willow, and a citron and shaking them, okay? It just doesn't make sense. So according to this guideline, a non-Jew could definitely sit in a sukkah, could definitely enjoy the sukkah, perhaps even build one, but that taking the four species together would be something they shouldn't do because it doesn't make sense. They wouldn't have thought of it had it not been what was commanded to the Jewish people. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, all right, so now obviously there's a lot of gray area and room for interpretation. And again, like I said, I would recommend that somebody who is a Noahide who's not in transition to conversion find a Noahide friendly or Noahide knowledgeable rabbi in your community if you live near a Jewish community. Um, if you don't, you might have to look online or try to find one somewhere else. But someone that you can ask what you can do and what you can't do. Otherwise, if you're relying on me for guidance, I think that this guideline actually makes a lot of sense and it, it, it does leave a lot of room for variation, but it, it makes sense to me that if you, know, you're, you wanna celebrate the holiday, but you're not gonna celebrate the holiday the exact same way the Jews do it, then pick the aspects of it that make sense to some degree and leave the ones that are just like, who would have thought of that, right? All right, so Sukkot is only, like I said, seven days long, but the eighth day is a holiday also, all right? And it's considered a separate holiday. The eighth day, we do not live in the Sukkah. This eighth day is called Shmini Atzeret, which means the eighth day gathering, okay? and or eighth day assembly and it is the conclusion of the holiday of sukkot and believed to be the day that the books are actually finally sealed for the coming year all right so regardless of what happens on rosh hashanah and yom kippur by the end of sukkot everybody's uh destiny if you will has been written in the book for the year as far as whether it's what we're going to have coming to us or what we're going to, to see is to have to deal with during the year. Now that doesn't remove our ability to have free will because it's always up to us what we do with the challenges or the blessings that come our way, but that those have been decided for the year at that time, just as we count the, the animals or count the crops and we give a portion of them uh, to God in the same way we are accounted and our portion is given to us for the year at that point, all right? Now, um, it's on this day in Israel that we also celebrate our joy in having been given the Torah. Outside of Israel, because there's two last days, right? Because every holiday is doubled, the, the holidays that you actually, that are Yom Tovs, that are like Shabbats, are doubled except for Yom Kippur. Um, outside of Israel. So they have an eighth and ninth day, if you will. And what they do is they celebrate Shmini Atzeret on the eighth day. And then on the ninth day, they do something called Simchat Torah, which means joy in the Torah. In Israel, both of those holidays are combined together. We do Simchat Torah on Shmini Atzeret, okay? Because Simchat Torah is a rabbinic addition to the holiday. Now, like I said, the days in the middle are called Cholomoed, which means weekdays of the festival, all right? And these days are semi-holidays. I already mentioned that. In Israel, there are some stores that are closed 
Uh, a lot of clothing stores are not open, and a lot of stores have shortened hours so that the people that work in them can at least have a partial day off. The other two, so now we've covered Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Simcha, uh, Sukkot, and Shmini Atzeret. We talked about the intermediary days of the holiday, the seven-day holiday, which are called Chol HaMoed, um, and Sukkot being one of the three pilgrimage festivals. The other two of the three pilgrimage festivals occur in the spring, and um, they are the other two of the biblically mandated holidays. So they are Passover, or Pesach, and Shavuot, which is translated as Feast of Weeks, the New Testament calls it Pentecost. Why is it called Pentecost? Pente means five and cost means to count. So it's the count of 50. And so we'll get into a second in a second where that comes from. All right, now Passover, we could do like a whole three month series just on Passover. Um, so this is gonna be very, very brief, very short overview um, for Passover. But it, we read in Vayikra 23, in the first of the month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is Hashem's, the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Hashem. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, so that means it's a yom tov. You shall not do any laborious work, but for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to Hashem. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Okay, so in this case now, just like Sukkot, we have seven days, except on Passover, the seventh day is a holiday rather than the eighth day. Okay, so for Sukkot, we have this extra day on the end, and that's the holiday. But for Passover, we celebrate for seven days, the seventh day being this other Yom Tov, all right? Now, the basics for Passover is that we don't eat any what is called chametz on Passover. The word chametz is translated usually as leavening, but it's really a form of fermentation. This is what happens when any of the five basic grains are exposed to water. What are the five basic grains? They are wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. Okay? These are the five grains that you can make the blessing of hamotzion that are considered bread. And the rabbis have determined that it takes about 18 minutes of exposure to water or some liquid for the fermentation process to begin. So, matzah made from Passover. What's matzah? Matzah is flour and water, right? So, in order for the uh, matzah made for Passover, sorry, matzah made for Passover must go through, must go from the mixing with water to completely cooked in less than 18 minutes, all right? This is why some matzah, which could be used during the year, is not kosher for Passover. In other words, they didn't watch it, they didn't make sure that it was cooked within that 18 minutes from the time it got wet to the time it's, it's uh, fully cooked because it's a whole procedure. Sometime you should Google on YouTube, how do they make matzah? It's really fascinating. I've actually, in Israel, participated in making kosher for Passover matzah. I actually made my own matzah several years. Um, I mean, along with a group of people, everybody had a different job and we all made this big batch and then we divided it among everybody. But um, so that's why some matzah used during the year is not kosher for Passover. Also, the grain used for Passover matzah is meticulously watched from the time it's harvested until the final product to make sure that it's not exposed to moisture, all right? However, because chametz really refers to this special fermentation process that only these five grains can go through, other items that you might think of as leavening, and this was a mistake that I made before I became religious, 
when I say became religious, I mean became an Orthodox Jew. When I was involved in the Messianic world, I thought that leavening meant all sorts of things that it doesn't mean because that word chametz actually refers to the specific fermentation process of those five grains being exposed to moisture, all right? So since that is the only thing that can be chametz, other items that might be thought of as leavening agents are actually completely permissible, right? You might not think so, but baking powder is fine. Baking soda is fine as long as they don't have any wheat product, you know, any grain products in them. And yes, even yeast is permissible on Passover. The prohibition does not include yeast. Now, yeast that's a product of one of the five grains would be prohibited on Passover, but yeast that is the product of grapes or any other fruit or its sugars, because yeast comes from a wide variety of sources, that's not considered chametz, and that's why it's okay to drink wine on Passover. Think about it. Wine is produced by what? It's the process of the yeast consuming the sugar and creating alcohol, right? But as long as it's not one of the five grains, it does not count as chametz, and that yeast is permissible on Passover. Now, the, I don't know what the yeast we normally use during the year to make bread. I don't know what that's made from, and I don't know if you could get that type of yeast kosher for Passover. I mean, I don't even know what the purpose would be. I wouldn't know how you could use that with stuff that is permissible on Passover to do anything. But you don't have to, for example, throw out your yeast. Uh, well, I take that back, unless it's made from one of those grains. So we wouldn't, you would have to know where the yeast comes from. But technically, yeast is permissible on Passover. Okay. Um, and the primary feature of Passover is, of course, the Passover Seder. Now, the Seder, which we think of as the meal, simply means order. The word Seder means order, all right? And the Seder is the order of the service that we do at the table that we navigate during this special event. And the concept of the Seder comes from uh, Shemot, which is Exodus chapter 13. I'm going to read it to you. It's 13 verses 4 through 10 if you want to look it up. On this day in the month of Aviv, you are about to go forth. It shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, in other words, Israel, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this rite in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. You shall tell your son on that day, this is the part where the Seder comes from, you shall tell your son on that day, saying, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. So that's why there is a huge emphasis on children at Passover time. And doing things at the table, the Seder takes four hours, which can be very, very difficult for children, even older children, to sit through. So there's all sorts of things. First of all, there's questions that are kind of worked into the Seder, but also people will put um, candies on the table um, that if the child asks a question, uh, they'll get a candy to encourage them to be interactive and active in the process so that they can stay awake and they can pay attention. Big, big emphasis on children in the Seder because it comes from this commandment to tell the story to our children, all right? Now, you may have heard that non-Jews are not allowed to attend a Passover Seder. And while some do hold this way, it is not the majority of opinion. It comes from a passage in Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 through 49, which says, 
The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. Any slave you have bought may eat of it after you have circumcised him. But a temporary resident and a hired worker may not eat of it. It must be eaten inside one house. Take none of the meat outside of the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover, in other words, that would be a Noahide, right? Must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat of it. The same law applies to the native born and to the alien living among you. All right, now, from this passage, we see that in the time when the ritual Passover lamb was consumed, that it would have been when the temple was standing, um, and possibly for some centuries afterwards, only those who were members of the community of Israel, meaning Jews, but also those who lived among the Jews, right? The ger, or ger toshav. So, which the term ger is a very difficult term because it has two meanings. Um, ger is used to refer to a convert, but a ger is also used to refer to the righteous Gentiles who lived with the Jewish people but did not convert to Judaism, all right? And so we see that members of this community who were not necessarily Jews were allowed to eat of it if they were circumcised, all right? Um, but the consumption consisted of the essence of the celebration of the Passover Seder. That was it. And it excluded the male uncircumcised not carrying the community of Abraham in their flesh. So in other words, if, if somebody lived among the Jews but didn't want to get circumcised, it meant that he didn't identify himself as being uh, aligned with or in unity with the Jewish community. So if somebody did undergo circumcision to kind of uh, align himself with the Jewish community, then he would be completely allowed to partake of the Passover lamb sacrifice even you know, during the time of the temple. But since there's no temple today, we don't eat a sacrifice at the Seder. Everything else we do, but we don't eat sacrificed lamb. In fact, we are forbidden from doing that because we are forbidden from offering a sacrifice anywhere except at the temple. So since nobody can eat that anyway, many rabbis have said for the purpose of friendship, for the purpose of fellowship, whatever, you know, it's okay for non-Jews to attend a Passover Seder. All right. Passover is also seven days, just as Sukkot is. But its concluding holiday is not at the end of the week, like the last day. I mean, okay, so the seventh day is a Yom Tov. So we have a Yom Tov at the beginning and a Yom Tov at the end. But that is not considered the concluding holiday, like on Sukkot, where we, the last day is a separate holiday. Um, I know it's a little confusing, but... Basically, the day after the Yom Tov, basically the day after our Seder, day begins in the evening, so we count. So, like, let's say um, the Passover Seder is on a Monday night. So, the first day of Passover is Monday. That day is a holiday. It started, uh, sorry, Tuesday. It started Monday night. It goes until sundown on Tuesday. Sundown on Tuesday, we begin counting, and we count, it says in Vayikra 23, verses 15 through 16, you shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, now this is the Sabbath of the Yom Tov, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. So back in temple times, there was actually a debate as to whether the day after the Sabbath meant the first Sunday in Passover or meant the day after the holiday, which is the first day of Passover. 
since all of the holy days are referred to as Sabbaths to Hashem, it could be taken either way. It was a difference of opinion between the group of Jews that were called the Pharisees, who were the forefathers of the Judaism that we have today, and the Sadducees, who died out with the destruction of the temple. All right, now the opinion of the Pharisees, the forefathers of modern day rabbinic Judaism, was that the term Sabbath there referred to the, the rest day of the first day of Pesach. And so we begin counting on the second day of Passover. That way, Shavuot is always the same day on the Jewish calendar, okay? It's always 50 days after the 15th of, Nis of Aviv, uh, of Nisan, same, same holiday, all right? Uh, so the 50th day is that so this counting sorry the counting of the 49 days or 50 days is called the counting of the omer and the omer is the word that refers to that wave offering that we were to bring so the 50th day is the day of shavuot and that's why in the greek it's referred to as pentecost because it's the counting of 50 and uh, in english we just call it the feast of weeks because it's seven complete weeks it's the day after the seven complete weeks from Passover. Um, and that is the third pilgrimage festival, which required that all of the Jews come to Jerusalem to bring their offerings to God. All right. Are there any questions so far? Okay. I have a question. Sorry. Yeah, sure. No, go ahead. <laughs> Just how you saying the Yom Tovs are called a Sabbath to Hashem. Yes. So are they like why is cooking allowed like how how did that get decided that there was like the cooking was allowed differently to a regular sabbath okay so i don't have the passage uh, right here in front of me last week i went over this section that says that on the holiday you will observe it as a sabbath except that you are allowed to prepare food it uh, says that directly okay. in the Torah. And so yeah. then the rabbis derive from that what that includes and what that doesn't include. So I don't yeah. know if you remember, but last week we talked about you can transfer fire because fire is required for cooking, but that does not negate the commandment against kindling a fire. So we can't light, excuse me, we can't light a new fire, but we are allowed to cook because the Torah makes the distinction between the Yom Tovs and the Shabbats as far as cooking goes. All right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. No problem. I can, if you uh, need me to find the passage, I can find it for you later. No, I remember it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Before, uh, yeah. It's all right. It's been a whole week. What do you want? You know? <laughs> um, okay. So on Shavuot, we cease from work as we do with every holiday. We start by lighting candles. We go to synagogue. The evening service tends to be quite long as there is a lot of singing and dancing. Oh, uh, actually, I need to back up a second because I didn't talk about uh, the last day, Shmini Atzeret, which is also Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah, um, in America being a separate day, is the service is very long. It often lasts several hours as people do a lot of singing and dancing with the Torah. Um, some communities, only the men dance with the Torah. Other communities, the women do as well. Um, and it means that dinner is, is kind of late. Um, in some communities, it goes to midnight. Now, on Shavuot, we actually celebrate... Um, Shavuot as the time of the giving of the Torah, because that's when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people was on Shavuot. So the way that Shavuot is commemorated in the Jewish community, besides being a regular Yom Tov with, a, you know, we start by lighting the candles and then we have, we go to shul and we pray, we have a regular holiday service, and then we come home and we have our festive meal. And then it is the custom for 
uh, people to stay up all night and to learn Torah all night on Shavuot. So what happens is um, a lot of times there's, uh, there's, first of all, there's a tradition to eat only dairy foods for one of the meals. And as part of that, to make cheesecake. Why is that a tradition? It's a tradition because it is understood that from the time that God told the Jewish people to prepare to receive the Torah, to the time that they received the Torah, so, uh, or actually, no, sorry, when the Jewish people received the Torah, which included the laws of separation of milk and meat and kosher, so they had a problem because they had dishes that could, that had both eaten on them or something like that. So for the days that it took for them to, um, get the uh, new dishes, their dishes kosher, whatever, the tradition says that they only ate dairy because they needed to learn the laws of what they had to kill the animals and, uh, you know, how to separate things and whatever. So they, for those several days, they only ate dairy. So we have the tradition that on Shavuot, many people will have at least one of the two meals for the holiday, only dairy. So a lot of times what happens is, is in the evening meal we'll have dairy because that way everybody can have cheesecake while they're learning Torah all night. So a lot of Jewish women take, a great, take great pride in, um, in their cheesecake recipes. And um, they, uh, oh, it's amazing some of the recipes that are out there. And... Um, and yeah, so Jewish communities where there are lots of Jewish community, where there's a lot of Jewish people will often have a, a whole night, a whole schedule of classes for men and women, not just like sitting and learning from the Torah, but actual classes. So um, I've been invited to give my story some of those times. And um, so that's, that's Shavuot. Okay. Um, so to review. We have six biblically mandated holidays, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeret, Passover, Pesach, and Shavuot. All right? The three pilgrimage festivals are Sukkot, Passover, and Shavuot. One of those six man mandated holidays is the fast day of Yom Kippur. Right? We also have the biblical command to count 49 days from the first day of Passover until the holiday of Shavuot. Now, I have to breeze through these because we're almost out of time. But fast days. There are also six fast days during the Jewish year. Now, we have a little bit of a redundancy because I have Yom Kippur listed in both lists. But there's a saying that we use to remember the six fasts, okay? We call it long, short, male, female, black, white. The long fast day is the 17th of Tammuz. And that's because in the Northern Hemisphere, it is in the summer. All right, so in our Australian friend is going to have to reverse those two. <laughs> the short one, which is the 10th of Tevet, which we just had, is short because it's in the winter. The male fast is the fast of Gedalia, which is the day after Rosh Hashanah. The female fast is the fast of Esther right, which we see, which takes place in the book of Esther. The black one is Tisha B'Av, and the white one is Yom Kippur. Black being because it's for mourning, and white because it's the Day of Atonement, is for purity. The last two, Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur, are considered major fast days, and they last 25 hours. The other four are considered minor fast days, and they're only from sunrise to sunset. Now, although Yom Kippur is the only fast that's biblically mandated, fa fa the fast of Esther can be found, of course, in the book of Esther. Um, the story of Gedalia is also found in the Bible as well, although there's no mention, actual mention of like fasting in the story. However, we fast in remembrance of the event and that it marked the end of Jewish autonomy following the destruction of the first temple. That story can be found in 2 Kings chapter 25, 
verses 25 through 26, I guess. Um, now, before I go over the, over the other fast days and what they're about, I want to show you something, though. There is actually a place in the Tanakh where all the fast days, even though they hadn't all been, the events hadn't occurred yet, all of the fast days, other than the two that are mentioned in the Bible separately, are mentioned in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah, so love truth for the house of Judah, so love truth and peace. Okay. So basically we have um, two that are not mentioned there, but the fast of the fourth month is the 17th of Tammuz. The fast of the fifth month is Tisha B'Av. The fast of the seventh month is the fast of Gedalia. And the fast of the 10th is the fast of the 10th of Tevet. The only two fasts not mentioned in this passage, in this prophecy are with Yom Kippur and the Fast of Esther. Now, the Fast of Esther is very specific to the events that happened at the time of Purim. And Yom Kippur, of course, is biblically commanded. The other four fast days, the ones that are mentioned in this passage, what is the passage saying? That there's going to come a time in the future when these fast days are going to turn into festivals, that, that the Jewish people are going to be able to celebrate and they're no, no longer going to need to fast. All four of those fast days are in remembrance of an event that led to the destruction of the first temple or the second temple or the exile of the Jews from their land. Okay? So what he's saying is, is he's going to bring us all back into the land and he's going to give us a reason to turn those fast days into rejoicing. Okay? Including Tisha B'Av, which is major. All right. So when I wrote this, um, <laughs> it was the fast of the 10th of Tevet, which commemorates the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, and um, an event that began on that date and ultimately culminated in the destruction of Solomon's temple, which is the first temple, and the conquest of the kingdom of Judah, all right, which today is central Israel. Now, according to 2 Kings chapter 25, on the 10th day of the 10th month, which is Tevet when counted from Nisan, the first month, according to Exodus 12, right? First month is Nisan. In the ninth year of Zedekiah's, Zedekiah, his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, began the siege of Jerusalem. Two and a half years later, on the 17th of Tammuz, which is the other fast day, another of the fast days, at the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign, he broke through the city walls. The siege extent ended with the destruction of the temple three weeks later on the 9th of Av. The end of the first kingdoms and the exile of the Jewish people to Babylon. The tenth of Tevet is thus considered part of this cycle of fasts connected with these events, which includes the seventeenth of Tammuz and Tisha B'Av. Okay, so um, there's more that I could cover. The other two holidays that have not been mentioned is Purim and Hanukkah. The Purim story, of course, we read from the Book of Esther. And everybody knows that that recalls Esther saving the Jewish people. Uh, why do we dress up on Purim? It's not just about imitating the characters that were in the story, but um, on Purim, we dress up because of the fact that basically the purpose is to hide your identity because there are two aspects of hiding one's identity that are found in the story of Esther. Number one, God, even though he's present throughout the story, is never actually mentioned in the story. The book of Esther does not mention the name of God, not one time. Um, it's said that he is hiding, which is really interesting because the word for hiding is Hester, which sounds a lot like Esther. 
Um, right? So it's very similar. Also in the story, Esther conceals her true identity, which is part of the whole story of how she comes to save her people. So um, we hide our identity on Passover. And then the last, ho- or Purim, sorry. And then the last holiday that I'm just going to give you briefly mention is Hanukkah, which we just celebrated, which is the story of the defeat of a small group of Jews during the Greek occupation of Israel during the time of the second temple. Although the most noted part of the holiday is lighting candles and eating food fried in oil, right? To remember this oil that uh, when they rededicated the temple, there was only enough uh, pure sanctified oil for one day for the menorah, but it lasted eight days until more could be made. The real miracle, though, is the defeat of the Greek army by just a small group of determined Jews who would not be forbidden, uh, who would not allow themselves to be forbidden from practicing their faith. Okay? Other than that, we also have in Israel, we have Holocaust Memorial Day, Memorial Day, and Independence Day, as well as Jerusalem Reunification Day. Uh, Us Jews, we like to celebrate a lot. And we have a lot of holidays, but we also have the fast day. So we have a lot of up and down. And that's basically an overview of the entire year. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, have an absolutely amazing week. Next week, we're going to be looking at Jewish prayer. Okay? All right. Good night, everybody.